Neville, Neilon, I, the Tetragrammaton, the Lord God Most High, I do exercise the Indian to powerfully command me, O Spirit. Neilon, I, the Tetragrammaton, the Lord God Most High, I do exercise the Indian to powerfully command In the dark shadows, in the white cold, Fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the Abracast. We are the brave and the bold. A court, history, conspiracy. This is the Abercast, and I'm your host, Dr. John Towers. Last week I spent a little bit of time um, messaging with some listeners and stuff about prepping. I would mentioned in a previous episode that um, I had started sort of taking it seriously. Like, I would just keep, like, some cans and shit in the basement uh, previously, um... And be like, okay, well, I'm prepared. <laughs> like, kids fucking SpaghettiOs. But I mentioned um, that I had started taking stuff s- seriously. And uh, I had um, a few listeners reaching out to me um, and asking me what I was doing and or suggest- suggesting things to, to do. Sort of the way that I've been boiling it down is beans, band-aids, and bullets, which is the uh, the deal, like the primary job of a first sergeant when you're deployed, right? When you're, when you're in the field, that's what his deal is. Be getting beans, getting bullets and getting band-aids. It's a logistical, um, well, it's like, it's a logistical problem. And I feel like that is a good thing when we're talking about preparing. So whether, I don't know what, I I don't know what everyone's thoughts are. So if you're preparing for, you know, a zombie invasion, remember when dot gov did that, they were like how to prepare for a zombie invasion because it was like preparing for any kind of stupid emergency. And the whole world was watching that stupid walking dead. Um, so it's like, if you're dealing, if you're trying to prepare for a tornado, you know, or a zombie invasion or, you know, the collapse of Western civilization, we, you know, I'm looking back to, um, the words of the, the great general, the two and a half thousand year old words of the great general Sun Tzu and, and talking about the art of war, not as offensive, not as, you know, we're going to go and take over this, what X, whatever it is, but he talks a lot about, um, he talks a lot about planning and he talks a lot about, uh, logistics. He talks a lot of, in common parlance, he talks a lot about beans, bullets, and band-aids, um, so last episode we did uh, the first, I guess, I don't know, the first third, I guess, of um, the James Clavell edited The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And tonight we're going to be doing probably the second third and uh, getting through that. And, you know, I I feel like it's something that's at, it's at, at least worth checking out. It's at least worth talking about you know i um i've mentioned 
last episode that this is one of these books that I got like when I was in high school and I've just drug it with me for forever. It's a annotated by Dr. John Towers. It's um, highlighted uh, by me. It's warped and stained and disheveled. Usually I take really good care of my books. I don't remember what happened, what had happened to this poor book, <laughs> but we're going to, instead of, I have, actually I have multiple copies of this, but I wanted to read out of this one because I have like this sentimental, emotional attachment to this poor <laughs> fucking thing. So, um, so we're going to get, that's what we're going to do. But before we do that, I just want to say, let everybody know that I have my vessel of the art here and, uh, it's chock full to the brim. It's good to the last drop. My, uh, formula for mass distraction, the, uh, infamous Jin Jihad. So let's, uh, all right, let's get into it. Uh, before we, <laughs> before we <laughs> uh, get going, uh, I just need to qualify um, uh, a comment that I had in the last episode where I was talking about the infamous House of Pain song that references Sun Tzu, and I butchered it and I fucked it all up, and then. And then I was thinking, I don't even know if it's infamous. Like, I don't know how many people actually, I mean, this isn't the how the house of pain is in effect, y'all. It's not that song. It's not jump around. So in the nineties, there was this, um, movie called, what was, uh, it was called Trespass, and it was about a bunch of firefighters that were like heisting something and. I can't remember. Bill Paxton might have been in it. But the movie is totally forgettable. Ice. One of the Ices. One of the Ices were in it. Anyhow, the movie is totally forgettable. But what isn't forgettable about this movie is the soundtrack. The soundtrack to this movie, Trespass, is amazing. It did a lot of work for like what they would call new metal nowadays or you know, the rock rap, um, mix mixing, you know, this was after, um, walk this way with run DMC and Aerosmith, but this was before Limp Biscuit. you know what I mean? So, uh, they would do what happened for the motion picture soundtrack to trespass is they would have a rock act and a rap act and they would get together and come up with uh songs and they were they were awesome the whole almost the whole (laughs) almost the whole cd was fantastic i haven't listened to it in forever but that's what was stuck in my head and um I don't know. I don't know if I should perform some of this for you guys, or maybe if you're if you're unaware of it, you could just uh, put it on Spotify or something. But he definitely references Sun Tzu. He goes, uh, "Holy diver, I'm a survivor, feeling like De Niro in Taxi Driver with Jodie Foster and Harvey Keitel. It looks like I'm walking through a living hell. So spark that L, and I'll get lifted." Feeling the effects of what my spliff did. Cause I'm gifted. I read Sun Tzu. I brought a gun too so you'll never come to. The weight of the world's riding on my shoulders. Cause I'm a soldier. I thought I told ya. Do do just another victim kid. Just another victim. Anyhow. <laughs> I feel like I had to. <laughs> I feel like I had to redeem myself a little bit. Okay so. Um, the art of war by the great Sun Tzu. Chapter six. Whoa, sorry. Chapter six. Weak points and strong. The impact of your army be like the grindstone dashed against an egg. Use the science of weak points and strong. Whoever is the first in the field and awaits the coming enemy will be fresh for the fight. Whoever is second in the field and has to hasten battle will arrive exhausted. So we see this all the time. You know, whenever we talk about tying formations into terrain features, Bodica did this um, in that old episode we did. And we just recently revisited 
the Battle of Tours, where Charles the Hammer Martel did the same thing. He uh, created his men stood like a glacier, <laughs> and he forced uh, he forced the Islamists to attack to attack him uh, where he chose to put his for- formation, and then he d- d- fucking destroyed them. Therefore, the clever combatant imposes his will on the enemy, but does not allow the enemy's will to be imposed on him. By holding out advantages to him, he can cause the enemy to approach of his own accord, or by afflicting damage, he can make it impossible for the enemy to draw near. In the first case, he will entice him with a bait. In the second, he will strike at some important point that the enemy will have to defend the enemy is taking his ease, harass him, if quietly encamped, force him to move, if well supplied with food, starve him out. Appear at points that the enemy must hasten to defend, march swiftly to the places where you are not expected. An army may march great distances without distress, if it marches through a country where the enemy is not you can be sure of succeeding in your attacks. If you only attack places that are undefeated, uh, or sorry, undefended, you can ensure the safety of your defense. If you only hold positions that cannot be attacked, the gen- that general is skillful in attack whose opponent does not know what to defend. He is skillful in defense whose opponent does not know what to attack. He who is skilled in the attacks flashes forth from the topmost heights of heaven, making it impossible for the enemy to guard against him. This being so, the places that he shall attack are precisely those that the enemy cannot defend. He who is skilled in defense hides in the most secret recesses of the earth, making it impossible for the enemy to estimate his whereabouts. This being so, the place that he shall hold are precisely those the enemy cannot attack. Oh, divine art of subtlety and secrecy. Through, uh, you were to learn to be invisible, though through you inaudible. And hence, we can hold the enemy's fate in our hands. You may advance and absolutely irresistible if you make it for the enemy's weak points. You may retire and be safe from pursuit if your movements are more rapid than those of the enemy. If we wish to fight, the enemy can be forced to an engagement, even though he be sheltered behind a high rampart in a deep ditch. All we need to do is to attack some other place that he will be obliged to relieve. The enemy is, is, if the enemy is the invading party, we can cut off his lines of what communication and occupy those roads by which he will have to return. If we are the invaders, we may direct our attack against the sovereign himself. If we do not wish to fight, we can prevent the enemy from engaging us even though the lines of our encampment be merely traced out on the ground. All we need to do is throw something odd and unaccountable his way. Tumu relates the stratagem of Chuko Ling, who in 149 BC, when occupying Yang Ping uh, and about to be attacked by Su Ma, I suddenly struck his colors, stopped the beating of the drums and flung open the city gates, showing only a few men engaged in sweeping and sprinkling the ground. This unexpected uh, proceeding had the intended effect for Su Ma, I, suspecting an ambush, actually drew off his army and retreated. By discovering the enemy's disposition and remaining invisible ourselves, we can keep our forces concentrated while the enemy must be divided. If the enemy's dispositions are visible, we can make for him in one body, whereas our own dispositions being kept secret, the enemy will be obliged to divide his forces in order to guard against attack from every quarter. 
We can form a single united body while the enemy must split into fractions. Hence, there will be a whole pitted against separate parts of a whole. Which means that we shall be many in the enemy's few. And if we are able thus to attack an inferior force with a superior, our opponents will be in dire straits. So here, I'm an... <laughs> Hold on. So this is the difference between Sun Tzu and Captain America. <laughs> In Endgame, when after Th past Thanos shows up to, to fuck the whole world up, and uh, Captain America wakes up because he's been by knocked out or something, and uh, Iron Man wakes him up, and he, they go and they survey what's up. Thanos is standing there in the middle of field of battle, sitting there waiting, helmet off, drawling them in. <clears throat> and our guys, I, Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America, have a quick huddle, and they're like, well, what are we going to do? Well, you know it's a trap, right? Yeah, we know it's a trap. Let's Now it's time to spring the trap. And it, Thor goes, as long as we're all in agreement. And he starts, like, summoning his hammers and all this shit. And then they just come at him. Like, they're not in, like, a wedge formation. And they're not in a two-column formation. No one breaks to try to flank Thanos. They all just walk towards him like a scrimmage, like a scrimmage line or something. Like, no tactical value to the maneuver. <laughs> Uh, the spot where we intended to fight must not be made known, for then the enemy will have to prepare against a possible attack at several different points. And as forces being thus distributed in many, direct, in many directions, the numbers we shall have to face at any given point will be proportionately few. Alright, so I don't know what the correct answer is. Um, when I watch that scene, I think... Well, Thor should have came at him head on. And the other two guys, preferably Iron Man, because he's got a lot of more defensive capability. But I don't know, Captain America's shield pretty sweet too. The other two guys should have tried to flank him and they could attack him all at once instead of all three of them getting their asses fucking handed to him. But really, the answer would have been if they could have held off, waited until they figured out where the infinity gauntlet was and then used that to draw thanos into into an ambush from them that is what sun tzu would have uh advised i think or maybe making them think that they had the the infinity gauntlet <clears throat> you know you have an extra one laying around somewhere or you can invent some kind of hologram or something or 3d print a fake real quick it's obvious he can't tell fakes because uh, he didn't know that the time stone was a fake in Infinity War until he got his hands on it. So these are the things that keep these are the things that keep me up at night. <laughs> for back to the book. For <laughs> should the enemy strengthen his van, he will weaken his rear. Should he strengthen his rear, he will equal his van. Should he strengthen his left, he will equal his right. Should he strengthen his right, he will weaken his left. If he sends reinforcements everywhere, he will be weak everywhere. In old in old war movies, they're like, never divide your forces. Uh, I believe that this is what Sun Tzu is talking about. So here we go. Let's think about it. Send Thor up front, down the middle. We'll send Thor down the middle, head on. And what... Uh, what f hand does he does Thanos wield the Infinity Gauntlet with? His right hand, right? So you send Iron Man to the right flank, and you send Captain America to the left flank, and also get him some god a goddamn offensive weapon for Christ's sakes. Why is it in the first Avengers movie he's allowed to use a machine gun? Did he use a machine gun in Captain America: The First Avenger? I think he probably did. 
So why has he stopped using guns? The guy's a fucking soldier. Soldiers have guns. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna stop trying to. <laughs> Numerical weakness comes from having to prepare against possible attacks. Numerical strength from compelling our adversary to making these preparations against us. Knowing the place and the time of the coming battle, we may concentrate from the greatest distances in order to fight. But if neither time nor place be known, then the left wing will be impotent to succor the right. The right equally impotent to succor the left. The van unable to relieve the rear. The rear to support the van. How much more so if the farthest portions of the army are almost a hundred li apart. Remember, li's are like 133.33 meters. Oh, sorry, that was the weight. Um, the li is 2.7 modern li make a mile. And even the nearest are separated by several li. Though the enemy is stronger in numbers, may prevent him from fighting. Scheme so as to discover his plans and the likelihood of their success. Rouse him and learn the principle of his activity or inactivity. Force him to reveal himself so as to find out his vulnerable spots. Careful to compare the opposing army with your own so that you may know where your strength is super abundant and where it is deficient. In making tactical dispositions, the higher pitch you can attain is to conceal them, conceal your dispositions, and you will be safe from the prying of the subtlest spies, from the machinations of the wisest brains. That the multitude cannot comprehend is how victory may be produced for them out of the enemy's own tactics. All men can see individual tactics necessary to conquer, but almost no one can see the strategy out of which total victory is evolved. Military tactics are like unto water, for water is natural course, runs away from the high places and hastens downwards. I have the high ground, Anakin. So in war... The way to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. Water shapes its course according to the nature of the ground over which it flows. The soldier works out his victory in relation to the foe whom he is facing. Therefore, just as the water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there is no constant conditions. The five elements, water, fire, wood, metal, earth, are not always equally predominant. The four seasons may make way for each other in turn. There are short days and long. The moon has its periods of waning and waxing. You can modify his tactics in relation to his opponents and thereby succeed in winning. may be called a heaven-born captain. Seven. Maneuvering. Without harm, without harmony in the state, no military expedition can be undertaken. Without harmony in the army, no battle array can be formed. In war, the general receives his command from the sovereign, having collected an army and concentrating his forces. He must blend and harmonize the different elements thereof before pitching his camp. After that comes technical, tactical maneuvering, and there is nothing more difficult. The difficulty consists in turning the devious into the direct, the misfortune into gain, thus to take the long circuitous route after an enticing the enemy out of the way, and although starting after him to retrieve the uh, to contrive the reach, the goal before him shows knowledge of the artifice of deviation. Tu Mu cites the famous march of Chao Shi in 270 BC to relieve the town of Ou, which was closely invested by a Ch Chayan army. The king of Chao first consulted Pian Pao, 
on the advisability of attempting a relief, but the later through the distance too great and intervening country too rugged and difficult. His Majesty then turned to Chow Shi, who fully admitted the hazardous nature of the march, but finally said, We shall be like two rats fighting in a hole, and the pluckier one will win. So he left the capital with his army, but had only gone a distance of 30 li. When he stopped and began throwing up entrenchments for 28 days, he continued strengthening his fortifications, and he took care that spies should carry the intelligence to the enemy. The Qian uh, general was overjoyed and attributed by his adversary's tardiness to the fact of the beleaguered city was in the Han state and thus not actually part of Chiao territory. But the spies had no sooner departed than Chao Shi began to uh, began a forced march lasting for two days and one night and arrived at the scene of action with such astonishing rapidity that he was able to occupy and command the position on the north hill before the enemy had got wind of his movements, a crushing defeat followed for the Qian forces who were obliged to raise the siege of OU in all haste and retreat across its border. Maneuvering with an, an army is advantageous with an undisciplined multitude, most dangerous. If you set a fully equipped army to march in order to snatch an advantage, um, the chances are that you will be too late. On the other hand, to detach a flying column for the purpose involves the sacrifice of its baggage and stores. Thus, if you order your men to roll up their buff coats and make forced marches without halting day or night, covering double the usual distance at a stretch and doing a hundred li in order to rest and advantage of all your three divisions will fall to the hands of the enemy. The stronger men will be in front, the jaded ones will fall behind, and on this plan, only one-tenth of your army will reach the destination. If you march 50 Li in order to outmaneuver the enemy, you will lose the leader of your first division, and only half your force will reach its goal. If you march 30 Li with the same object, two-thirds of your army will arrive. An army without its baggage train is lost. Without provisions, it is lost. And without bases of supply, it is lost. This is the logistics. <clears throat> we cannot enter into a, alliances with or until we are acquainted with the designs of our neighbors we are not fit to lead an army on the march unless we are familiar with the face of the country its mountains its forests its pitfalls its precipices the marshes and swamps, we shall be unable to turn natural advantages to account unless we make use of local guides. In war, practice dissimulation and you will succeed. Move only if there is a real advantage to be gained. Whether to concentrate or to divide your troops must be decided by the circumstances. Let your rapidity of that of the wind, your compactness of the forest, in raiding and plundering, be like fire, in immovability, like a mountain, or like Charles the Hammer in the Battle of Tours, like a glacier. Let your plans be dark and impenetrable at night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. When you plunder a countryside, let the spoil be divided among your men. When you capture a new territory, cut it up into allotments to benefit, to benefit the soldiery. Ponder and deliberate before you make, del I'm sorry, ponder and deliberate before you make a move. Will he conquer who has learned the artifice of deviation? Such is the art of maneuvering. 
For as the ancient book of army management says, on the field of battle, the spoken word does not carry far enough. Hence, the institution of gongs and drums. Nor can ordinary objects be seen clearly enough, hence the institution of banners and flags. Gongs and drums and banners and flags are means whereby the ears and the eyes of the host may be focused on one particular point, the host thus forming a single united body. It is impossible either for the brave to advance alone, nor for the cowardly to retreat alone. Tu Mu tells the story in this connection of Wu Qi, when he was fighting against the Qian state approximately 200 BC, before the battle had begun, begun one of his soldiers, a man of matchless daring, sallied forth by himself. He captured two heads from the enemy and returned to camp, and Wu Qi had the man instantly executed, whereupon an officer ventured uh, to remonstrate, saying, This man was a good soldier and ought not to have been beheaded. And Wu Qi replied, I fully believe he was a good soldier, but I had him beheaded because he acted without order. So, in the context of why we're examining this text, you know, in the way of prepping or, um, I don't know, home defense or... I guess it would be called small unit maneuvering if you're just trying to get you and your family out or whatever. The flags and all this stuff, the gongs and the drums and the flags, you know, that's like um, that's like Braveheart kind of stuff. That's like Signal core, <laughs> you know, kind of stuff on, on the battle on the battlefield. Uh, I suggest that if you're prepping and you're planning or you have a fault, like, you know, your bug out bags and all of this stuff, you should probably have some, a couple walkie talkies and, or train your wife in patrol hand signals. <laughs> like I do when we're, like when we're going to Walmart. This is the art of handling large masses of men. In night fighting, then, make such use of the signal fires and the drums and them, fighting by day or flags or banners as a means of influencing the ears and the eyes of your enemy. A whole army may be robbed of its spirit. A commander-in-chief may be robbed of his presence of mind. Li Chuan tells of an antidote of Cao Q the protege of Duke Chuang of Lu. The latter state was attacked by Qi, and the Duke was about to join battle after the first roll of the enemies of drums, when Xiao said, not just yet, only after their drums had beaten for the third time did he give the word for attack. Then they fought, and the men of Qi were un- Chi were utterly defeated. Questioned afterwards by the Duke as the meaning of his delay, Xiao Q replied in battle, a courageous spirit is everything. Now the first roll of the drum tends to create the spirit, but the second, it is already on the wane, and after the third, it is gone altogether. I attacked when their spirit was gone. And ours was at its height, hence our victory. The value of the whole army, the mighty host of a million men, is dependent on one man alone. Such is the influence of spirit. Now, a soldier's spirit is keenest in the morning. By noonday, it has begun to flag. In the evening, his mind is bent only on returning to camp. A clever general, therefore, avoids an army when its spirit is keen, but attacks when it is sluggish and inclined to return. Thus is the art of studying moods, discipline, and calm. He awaits in the appearance of disorder and hubbub among the enemy. This is the art of retaining self-possession. I highlighted this. I took a note on this. That's interesting. To be near the goal while the enemy is still far from it, to wait at the east, or sorry, to wait at ease while the enemy is toiling and struggling, to be well fed while the enemy is famished. This is the art of husbanding one's strength. 
to refrain from intercepting the enemy whose banners are at a perfect order, to refrain from attacking an army drawn up in calm and confident array. This is the art of studying circumstance. It is a military axiom not to advance uphill against an enemy, nor to oppose him when he comes downhill. Coming down the mountain! I bet you guys didn't know you were going to get so many musics today. Do not pursue an enemy who simulates flight. Do not attack soldiers whose tempers are keen. Do not swallow a bait ordered by the enemy. Do not interfere with an army that is returning home because a man whose heart is set on returning home will fight to the death against any attempt to bar his way. and is therefore too dangerous an opponent to be tackled. When you surround an army, leave an outlet free. This does not mean that the enemy will be allowed to, to escape. The object is to make him believe that there is a road to safety and thus prevent his fighting with courage of despair. You should not press a desperate foe too hard. I highlighted that too, and that's interesting. So I, uh, Ho Shi illustrates with the story taken from the life of Fei Yang Chiang, the general was surrounded by vastly superior army of the Kitians um, in the year A.D. 945. And the country was bare and desertless, and uh, the little Chinese force was soon in dire straits for want of water. The wells were bored. The wells they bored ran dry, and the men were reduced to squeezing lumps of mud and sucking out the moisture they should get one of these purification pumps i just scored <laughs> my my prepping my prepping experience their ranks thinned rapidly until at last fu yang chiang explained we are desperate men far better to die for our country than to go with fettered hands into captivity a strong gale happened to be blowing from the northeast and darkened the air with dense clouds of sandy dust, and Tu Cheng Wei was for waiting until he had abated before deciding on a final attack. But luckily another officer, Li Shao Cheng by name, was quicker to see the opportunity, and he said, They are many. And we are few, but in the midst of this sandstorm, our numbers will not be discernible. Victory will go to the strenuous fighter. And the wind will be our best ally. According, accordingly, Fu Ying Xiang made a sudden and wholly unexpected onslaught with his cavalry, routed the barbarians, and succeeded in breaking through to safety. And such is the art of warfare. Chapter 8. The Variation of Tactics When in difficult country, do not encamp. In country where high roads intersect to join hands with your allies, do not linger in dangerously isolated positions. In hemmed-in situations, you must resort to stratagem. In a desperate position, you must fight. There are roads that must be followed, towns that must be besieged. Or must not be besieged. I should correct myself. Almost 22 centuries ago, when invading a territory of Hasu Shu, Sao, oh God, Seiyao Kung ignored the city of Hao Pai, which lay directly in his path, and he pressed on into the heart of the country. This excellent strategy was rewarded by the subsequent capture of no fewer than 14 important districts. No town should be attacked, which, if taken, cannot be held, or if left alone, will not cause any trouble. Hsu Ying then urged the attack of Pai Yang and replied, the city is small and well fortified. Even if I succeed in taking it, 
uh, will be no great feat of arms, whereas if I fail, I shall make myself a, la a laughing stock. It is a great mistake to waste men in taking a town when the same expenditure of soldiers will gain a providence. So this is something that the Crusaders, specifically of the First and Second Crusades, could have taken into account. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can go to abercast.com, check out the featured topic links. There's a whole big section on, uh, cru on the Crusades. Back to this book. There are armies that must not be attacked, positions that must not be contested, commands of the sovereign that must not be that must not be obeyed. The general who thoroughly understands the advantages that accompany variation of tactics knows how to handle his troops. The general who does not understand that these may be well acquainted with the configuration of the country, yet he will not be able to turn his knowledge to practical account. In AD 404, Liu Yu pursued the rebel Hu Huan Husan up the Yangtze and fought a naval battle with him in the island of Chiang Hung. The loyal troops outnumbered only a few thousand while their opponents were in great force. But Huan Hussein, fearing the fate that was in store for him should be overcome, had a light boat made fast to the side of his war junk so that he might escape if necessary. And at a, mo at a moment's notice, the natural re result was that the fighting spirit of his soldiers was utterly quenched. When the loyalist made an attack from the windward with the fire ships all striving, with the utmost ardor to be first into the fray, Hussein, sorry, Huan Hussein's forces were routed, had to burn all their baggage, and fled for two days and nights without stopping. In the wise leader's plans, consideration of advantage and of disadvantage will be blended together. If our expectations of advantages of advantage be tempered in any way we may succeed in accomplishing the quintessential accomplishing the essential part of our schemes. If on the other hand, in the midst of difficulties, we are always ready to seize an advantage. We must extradite our ex <laughs> extradite ourselves uh, from misfortune, reduce the hostile chiefs by inflicting damage on them, make trouble for them and keep them constantly engaged. Hold out specious allurements and make them rush to any given point. Chie Lin adds to this section several ways of inflicting this injury. Entice away the enemy's best and wisest men so that he may be left without counselors. Introduce traitors into his country and the government policy may be rendered futile. Foment, foment intrigue and deceit. By thus so dissension between the rulers and the ministers, by means of every artful contrivance, cause deterioration among his men, and the waste of his treasure, corrupt the morals by insidious gifts, leading him into excess, disturb and unsettle his mind by presenting him with lovely women. The art of war teaches us to rely on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him. I've, hold on, I gotta make a note. I wanna, I'm gonna read that one again. The art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him. Not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made our position unassailable. There are five, <laughs> I mean, what does that mean in the context of why we're reading this? Um, it's not like you can dig a moat around your house, right? Like you can't do that. I remember when I was buying my house, <laughs> I was like, there's one specific point in my house, and I'm not going to get too specific, 
but there's one point in my house where I can basically defend every entrance. Ev- not every entrance, every easy entrance. I got the front door and the back door for one position. I got uh, a, the window in the back, the window in the front. Um, and then if I look up the stairs, I guess I just basically told you what it was. <laughs> but I hit, If anybody scaled up and busted through, it's funny because I was sitting there with the realtor and I'm like looking at this. And also I'm like, I'm on a hill. So I'm like, well, you know, if... Uh, if there's a deluge, I should be good up here at least for a couple of days. <laughs> now I know I'm going to die defending this house in the very spot. <laughs> Not on the chance of his own attacking, but rather on the fact that uh, we have made our position unassailable. There are five dangerous faults which may affect a general, of which the first two are recklessness, which leads to destruction, and cowardice, which leads to capture. Next, there is a delicacy of honor, which is sensitive to shame, and a hasty temper, which can provoke can be provoked by insults. Hayo is saying, when opposed in A.D. 357 by Huang Mi, to saying Chiang and others shut himself up behind his walls and refused to fight. To Chang Chiang said, our adversary is the choleric temper and is easily provoked and let us make our uh, constant sallies and break down his walls and then he will grow angry and come out once he can bring his force to battle it is doomed to be our prey this plan was acted upon and Yao has saying he came out to fight and he was lured on so far as swang as san wang by the enemy's pretend flight and finally attacked and slain the last of such faults is over solitude for his men which exposes him to worry and trouble for all the long run the troops will suffer more from the defeat or at best the prolonged nation of the war which will be the consequence these are the five besetting sins of a general ruinous to the conduct of war when an army is overthrown and its leader slain the cause the cause will surely be found among these five dangerous faults and let them be the subject of meditation. And with that, meditate on this. This has been the Abercast, The Art of War Part 2. I am uh, John Towers, and this is Hilla, who will tell you what the fuck is up next. Thank you for listening. And we hope that you enjoyed the show. Please send an email or find us on social media and let us know what you think about the show. We would appreciate it if you would give us a five-star rate and review wherever you find your favorite podcasts. You can find Stigmata Studios, graphic, novels, and comic books. Take control of your destiny. Understand your past. Put your present in context and know your future with a twist. Check out the Abercast Tarot Card Deck. Your body is your temple. So let's make sure you got a badass t-shirt on it. Variety of cool occult themed t-shirts. And other merch like stickers, wall art, mugs and more. Welcome to the Red Archive. Get access to over 50 hours of archived episodes. More bonus audio. Additional exclusive content. All this for only one dollar a month. Are you interested in the occult, history, conspiracy, and violence? Learn more at abracast.com.